Do you know how many stars the naked eye can see at night? It's about three to 4,000. Oh, really? We're unaided, yeah. Binoculars, it's 100 times that. Yeah. Telescopes, it's a billion times that. But eyes, three to 4,000 stars. Okay. When it's a full moon out, 300 stars. Yeah. Right. The moon wreaks havoc on our ability yeah. to see the rest of the universe. So our observing schedules with huge telescopes are split uh -huh. according to dark time or bright time. And if you look at, if you have bright time observations, it's the moon is up and you can only look at bright objects in the night sky. Wow. The deep universe only comes to us when the moon is not up. So very high mass stars are not especially stable objects. They, they remain stars for 100,000 at most a million years and they'll explode and become a supernova. If you're more massive than that, they will not explode because the gravity is so strong that it cannot explode against the strength of the gravity and it collapses into a black hole. So we expect black holes to have slightly less mass, somewhat less mass than the most massive stars that we know how to make. So if you have a hundred times the mass of the sun star, it'll lose half its mass over its life and you have a, a black hole that's 30 times the mass of the sun or 50 times the mass of the sun, fine. Put a pin in that. In the centers of galaxies, there are super massive black holes. Hundreds of thousands, millions times the mass of the sun. And we call, they're supermassive and they're black holes, we call them supermassive black holes because that's how we roll as astrophysicists. Well, could you have black holes somewhere in the middle of these two extremes? We do not know a phenomenon that will give you a black hole that's in between, that will birth a black hole that's in between these two, these two uh, categories. You can make a black hole that eats its way there, fine but we don't know how to make one. And we think, we, my, my colleagues who've done this, think they've discovered a black hole that is sitting in this sort of nether world where there's no evidence that it ate to become that massive. And we don't know how to explain it by the formation and death of stars and is nowhere near the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. So it's the frontier of research at this moment. I'm going to describe to you an extraordinary fact about water and why we're alive today. Let's take a lake that has fish in it. Temperature drops outside and the lake slowly begins to get cooler because there's a time lag between the air temperature and the waters. That's why the first freeze, the lake is still there. It's got to be cold longer. All right, so what happens? The water gets cold on the surface and it begins to shrink. It shrinks. That makes it denser. It falls to the bottom. It does that down to about four degrees Celsius. As it goes from four degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius, the freezing point, it begins to expand and become less dense than the water. So now, as the water wants to actually freeze, it stays on top. When it does freeze, you freeze the top surface of the lake. Well, how about the water below it? It's insulated from the dropping air temperature and the fish don't die. Imagine if ice were denser than water. What would happen? You'd freeze the top layer, it would sink. The bottom is frozen. Freeze the next layer, it sinks. And fish would be systematically forced to swim in shallower and shallower waters until they were all freeze-dried on the top surface of the lake and all fishes would be dead. Most of the water on Earth is salt water that you can't drink. Here's something that no one talks about. When the glaciers melt, where does the water go? Into the ocean? Back in the ocean. But this is now non-salty water going into the ocean. So you're mixing fresh water with brackish water and they occupy different places in the vertical profile of the ocean. And because salt water is heavier than fresh water. So fresh water occupies the top Right. But it's not as salty as the water at the below. And there are circulations in the ocean, not only up and down, you know, northern latitude, southern latitude, like the Gulf Stream, there's also circulation top to bottom. The combinations of all these circulations create the stability of the ocean. If you disrupt that, there are animal fishes that can't live anymore where they used to be because the salt level is different. Some animals might go extinct. Some weather patterns will change because the ocean affects climate. So this is why climate modeling is so complicated. What did you think about Elon Musk's idea about nuking the poles of Mars in order to make it warmer? Yeah, so some of these are kind of <laughs> pie in the sky ideas, right? but the, the, let's, let's get to what he's trying to get at. Yeah. What you want to do is you want to introduce warmth. You want to block the ultraviolet so that you can protect organic life, all right? So we have an ozone layer, it's the three oxygen atoms, O3. 
and ozone likes ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet light comes from the sun and gets eaten by ozone, gets eaten. And when you do that, the ultraviolet light doesn't make it to Earth's surface. So even though they say, oh, wear, wear uh, sunscreen and sunblock 45, yes, that's for the 1% of the ultraviolet that gets through the atmosphere. If you're above the atmosphere, you are fried. So, the, because ultraviolet is highly hostile to organic molecules and what we're made of as life. So, you want to protect, you want to give life a chance. So, you want to not only heat Mars, you want to find a way to block the ultraviolet light coming from the sun. So, you need some mechanism, if not ozone, or it just live underground, for example. I don't think we should think of the idea as a literal thing, but just it's a general principle of what you want to accomplish on Mars in doing so. So you want to warm it, you want to protect what could be the future of, of biochemistry, and then you seed it, and, you, and then you wait. You don't want to wait too long, you want to sort of speed it up if you could. And then you terraform Mars. Climate change will not make Earth uninhabitable. Climate change will make Earth a living hell. I live in New York City where in our harbor we have the Statue of Liberty. And there she is holding the Declaration of Independence. And in her left arm and her right arm is the torch. If you melt the water ice that's on, on land, the ocean level will rise to reach her left elbow. So that takes out all of New York City. And basically every other coastal city that we've spent thousands of years building since the dawn of civilization. So life will be very, very different. There are people who want to colonize other planets, give us an escape route. We trashed Earth, let's move elsewhere and hope we don't trash that. Well, there aren't many places to move. You'll vaporize on Venus, so you're not going to Venus. Mars rotates once every 24 hours. That's kind of interesting. It's tipped on its axis, as Earth is, which means it has seasons. It has polar ice caps, the way we still do at this moment. <laughs> and there's evidence of running water on its surface. So there's a chance we could terraform Mars, my favorite word of the past few decades. You turn something that's not like Earth into something that's like Earth. So then you just move there. So here's the catch. If you have the power of geoengineering, to turn Mars into Earth, then you have the power of geoengineering to turn Earth back into Earth. I'm not all that worried about artificial intelligence and robots taking over the world, but almost everyone I know who's an expert in it, they're worried. I'm reminded of Ray Bradbury, author of many great science fiction novel about Mars and other stories. He was once criticized. Someone asked him, Ray, why do you have all these apocalyptic, futuristic stories? Is this what you think we have in store for ourselves? And he says, I don't write these because I think that's what our future will be. I write these stories so that you know what future to avoid. And I said, ooh, that's deep. The fact that we've had our share of films that show computer intelligence taking over. I think it spooked us. And a little bit of spooking is a good thing. It means you'll move forward, you'll step lightly. But here's my reasoning for why I'm not as afraid as AI experts. Every manifestation of computer ability that has arisen has been parsed into some task or set of tasks that we previously had undertaken, and now the computer does it. So we used to build cars on an assembly line. Now robots build cars, and cars are better than they have ever been. People think of robots that'll run around and they'll have all this high intelligence. Well, go back 40 years ago, 50 years ago. People were imagining robots, humanoid robots, and then the robot would then drive your car. No. Not today. The car is the robot. So the idea that you would have what they call general intelligence, 
some kind of entity that can learn anything and do anything and do it better than any of us. I just don't see that as the direction things are headed. We'll have tasks. We'll get some really good computer to figure out how to do it better than we can. And then we, it happens. So I'm not as worried, but if the concerns of AI experts are real and we, we need to heed them. Yeah. There'll be a day when AI takes over and it'll make us their pets. <laughs> we should all behave, learn how to behave better because the day AI takes over, they're going to pass judgment on whether humans should continue or not in this world. They're rendering all these other animals extinct. They're destroying the environment. They can't even be shepherds of their own fate. Have you seen that thing on Jupiter, that storm that never quits? The big red thing. Isn't it suspicious to you that a storm there could go on for 350 years without a break and we never have storms that go on for 350 years without a break? First of all, when we have storms, it's in our atmosphere. We rotate once a day. And so that rotation creates a, what we call a Coriolis force, which air that moves from one latitude to another. The Coriolis force is heightened if you spin faster. So what is Jupiter? It's thousand times bigger than Earth. It's mostly gas and it rotates once in about 10 hours. You wanna talk about ferocious Coriolis forces. We have storms that last weeks on this little speck we call Earth that has this much atmosphere on it. Go to a planet that rotates twice as fast, is 10 times as wide, a thousand times the volume and is mostly gas. And you're complaining that it lasted 300 years. <laughs> What is a dwarf galaxy? It's a little galaxy. Well, that I figured. There are galaxies that you see, the ones the Magellan saw, smudges in the sky. Those are huge things. No, they're dwarf galaxies, like a hundredth the size of our galaxy. They How far outnumber big galaxies. They do. Yeah, so maybe we shouldn't be calling them dwarfs because they're the common size galaxy. We should just be called giants and they call them regular. What is the difference? Right. How many yeah. stars are in a galaxy galaxy? Our galaxy has several hundred billion stars. And in a dwarf galaxy? A billion, but more typically hundreds of millions. These are small numbers compared to full up red bloody galaxies. So tiny are dwarf galaxies and we tend to find them in the vicinity of big galaxies. But you know what happens? You know, they orbit the big galaxy, but the orbits are not stable and they do a death spiral in oh. and they get eaten by the larger galaxy. And we have a term for that. It's called galactic cannibalism. In fact, there are stars, there are streams of stars that we see in our own galaxy that have the same trajectory as one another through the stellar system that is the Milky Way. So they, they relate and you follow it and it comes back out and back in again. And so this is evidence that this was once a fleshy but dwarfy galaxy that we ate, ripped apart. And now the, the stars are just trying to have that some, the last bastions of a memory of what they once were, because they're getting stretched apart by the, what we call the tidal forces of our galaxy.